today on CityCast Philly. Atlanta, Chicago, and New York have transformed unused railroad lines into elevated parks. Philly's got one too, the Reading Viaduct. Well, sort of. The city and neighborhood groups in Center City and North Philly have spent 20 years trying to make this mile-long railway bridge a beautiful public park. But only a tiny piece has been completed. I'm speaking with Inga Saffron, architecture columnist at the Philadelphia Inquirer, about what's derailing the progress. It's Monday, August 21st. I'm Trina Nuri, and here's what Philly's talking about. Inga, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you, Trina. It's nice to be here. So the Reading Viaduct, it stretches between three different neighborhoods, so to speak, Poplar, Chinatown, and Callow Hill. It's probably one of my favorite sort of hidden gems of Philly. But for anyone listening who doesn't know where exactly this is and what this looks like, can you kind of describe the Reading Viaduct? So the Reading Viaduct, used to be the elevated tracks for the Reading Railroad, which terminated at this big head house at 12th and Market, right next to the Reading Terminal. And in the 80s, the city decided to unite two railroads, the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Reading Railroad, which had both gone bankrupt, and they unified them into one system. And to do that, they created this underground tunnel called the commuter rail tunnel. And then they didn't need those elevated tracks anymore. And they cut them off at Vine Street. So there's, it's, it's kind of this leftover piece of industrial infrastructure. It's overgrown with like grass and weeds now. It's actually pretty wonderful. It, it's this strip of wild land in the middle of this neighborhood that was once industrial, now becoming more residential. I remember a few years back, there was a giant swing (laughs) that people used to swing back and forth on. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. And people would go up there for their wedding photos, believe it or not, Mm because there's a fabulous backdrop of the center city skyline. So even though it's not officially a park, there are a lot of urban explorers who love to go there. There are also people living in tents and various makeshift shelters. So it's an interesting place. Now, I want to talk about the part of the park that exists now. Can you describe what that looks like? Some folks have called this phase one of this renovation project. Yeah. So after New York finished its High Line, it opened in 2009, Everybody wanted a High Line, and and Philadelphia had already been thinking about it. There there were some activists who began talking about it in the early 2000s here, and they wanted to to start with the viaduct itself, but then they discovered that the company that owns it, which is kind of the shell of, of the old Reading Railroad, it's a company that acquired some of the assets of the Reading Railroad is actually a movie theater company. They run movie theaters around the world. It just wasn't communicative, wouldn't give it up. And it turned out there was what they call a spur, an access ramp that was owned by SEPTA that was next to the viaduct. And so SEPTA agreed to give it to to the city for a dollar. And they were able to landscape that spur, which is only 1,300 feet, and, and turn it into a really nice park. And from that grew bigger and bigger plans that included not just the viaduct, but this other piece called the cut, which is another you know leftover piece of railroad infrastructure on the west side of Broad. And it's below street level. And so the rail park, which is the name of the group that runs the, the spur, They have a master plan that calls for three miles of trail uh, starting near the art museum and and going all the way up to Fairmont Avenue. So some parts have been redone. There's a larger vision for it. Who has to get on board to make this larger vision happen? Who's holding it up? Basically, the Reading 
company. Um, and the city's actually tried multiple times to acquire the viaduct from them. They've offered to buy it. They talked about foreclosing on it at one point because it's a very complicated tax issue. None of those things worked. And so now um, there's a bill that's been introduced into city council. And and that was the efforts of city council member Mark Squilla, who wants to get the business group Center City District involved, right? Right. Mark Squilla introduced a bill that would deputize a Center City District and Paul Levy, its, its current director, to negotiate with Reading. And the bill also allows the city to condemn the structure in the, in the event that Reading doesn't agree to sell it at a reasonable price. What will condemning do? That would start legal action. Basically, it forces a kind of negotiating process with the owner and the, the buyer. The city has to pay fair value, but the owner can contest that. So Paul Levy told me that he, he is prepared, if it comes to that, to do legal battle with Redding to get control. But the city absolutely has the legal power to condemn the structure and take it over. Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. Welcome to Welch's Fruit SMR. Enjoy the big, bold, vibrant sounds of real fruit. Orange. Pineapple. Apple juice. Strawberry spread. Sparkling rosé. Ah. Ah. Mm -mm -mm. Made with real fruit for a taste as bold as you. Welch's. Let's fruit stuff up. Now, this story gets even more complex and complicated because you write that CEO Paul Levy of the Center City District is retiring at the end of this year. So who's going to be leading these efforts? Well, he is. He's staying on uh, to do what he calls special projects. And this is one of them. He has a, a passion for this project. I, I think a legitimate passion for this project. And he will be on the board that runs the center city district. So yes, he's retiring, but I think it's a slow exit. And <laughs> Paul Levy has shown this amazing ability to get things done and you have to give him credit for that. And this is going to be a really difficult negotiation with Reading. Their behavior has perplexed a lot of people and he is very, very determined I think the other thing you can say about him is that he is is a proven fundraiser. He has promised to raise the entire cost. And how much is that price tag? Yeah. So I don't know what, you know, the price will be for the Reading company to sell this. But according to Paul Levy's estimates, a minimal renovation of the structure, and that involves remediation of all those chemicals you don't want repairing any any structural issues to the steel and installing a minimal bike path would cost $35 million. Inga, again, this all sounds so complicated <laughs> um, and a little bit confusing of all the different stakeholders involved. This is a really dynamic area. Mm -hmm. Are neighbors on the same page or are there different concerns? I think overall, neighbors want this park and they want the blight that the existing conditions cause to go away. Uh, even, you know, Chinatown, there was a point at which Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation actually opposed this park because, because they were afraid of gentrification. And, and now they've changed their minds. And, um, John Chin, who's the head of that, the Chinatown Development Corp 
told me in an interview that he now supports it and he supports it because, you know, the area has become more residential and, and they want more green space. So, so now we have, you know, I would say everyone on the same page about having a park that said, you know, a lot of people are concerned about Paul Levy flying solo. They want to make sure that they're part of the process and gentrification will happen. Absolutely. You know, this will drive up property values. I already saw on Instagram a realtor promoting my story. And I know he was promoting it because, you know, he wants to sell stuff. Interesting. Yeah. So gentrification will happen. And the only way you can mitigate it is to start right now (laughs) through either zoning changes or land acquisition or just thinking about it. I mean, we shouldn't think about this as gentrification of of residential properties exclusively. Because one of the really interesting things about this neighborhood is it's still dotted with all these commercial industrial users. There's these little warehouses and and small factories. Right, right. I don't know the answer, but I just know that we should be thinking about that. I'm curious to know more also about how neighbors can voice their opinions in these particular situations when changes happen in their neighborhoods? So there are two ways that neighbors can can voice their opinions. As the area has gotten more residential, there have been uh, civic associations that have been created. There's a couple of old ones and a couple of new ones. And then this group, the Friends of the Rail Park, which has itself been deputized to manage the rail park and, and plan the rail park, They've done a lot of community outreach. They just spent a hundred thousand dollars on a on a master plan. They were unaware that Paul was planning this, so they held held a lot of neighborhood meetings. They talked to residents. They're a great link with the community, and they're the ones who are going to have to run this viaduct when it's done. Have you heard from them what people said that they want in the rail park? I haven't seen the master plan, which I don't think is quite ready, but they have, you know, brought in a lot of interesting programming. Like they do a a Lunar New Year event and they have Tai Chi and they're, you know, they're really asking residents, what kind of programming do you want to see on the viaduct? And, you know, they're trying not to do this in a, in a top down way. And people have concerns about too much hardscape. What does that mean? Too much paved surface. Oh, okay. Um, And there are a lot of people who want to make sure this is done in an environmentally friendly way. I see. Okay. So, you know, that input's important. And if you just have one person who's running the show. How do you get all those ideas into one plan? Yeah. Yeah, No, I will say in fairness to Paul Levy. He has said he will do community engagement. There will be a public hearing in the fall in city council because like all bills, it has what they call two readings and the second reading will be in the fall. And that reading uh, includes a public hearing. So what's going to happen next? Like you mentioned, there's going to be a fall hearing possibly. What needs to happen in the coming months for this process, for this viaduct to kind of be that green space for this particular part of the city. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's kind of a long haul to be okay. honest, <laughs> but the first thing that will happen <laughs> is the procedural part. And that is the second reading of the bill, the public hearing, maybe the story I wrote will empower city planners to get involved more. You know, we, we want the city to be actively involved this is a public park for the neighborhood, but it's a public park for the whole city. For sure. And this is a recurring issue. The city really grossly underfunds its parks. And then it it outsources them to all these private managers. We've seen that at Franklin Square, where they have this six week long lantern festival that costs a lot of money. You need, you need to buy a ticket. We've seen it at Fairmount Waterworks, where you basically can't use it in the spring and summer and fall because it's a banquet hall. Um, So more and more, we're turning our parks over to third-party managers, and that's just another layer 
but it's very easy for the city because then it spends less on its parks and these private managers who do a great job often. I mean, I think the center city district has done a, a very good job at, at maintaining its parks through private fundraising, but it, it, it does make them less responsive to what the public wants. Interesting. Well, we'll definitely keep our eye on the story. That's Inga Saffron, architecture columnist at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thank you so much for breaking the story down with me on CityCast Philly. Oh, my pleasure. Nice to talk to you today. Check out Inga's full story in our show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. If you enjoyed this episode about the complexities of the Reading Viaduct project, tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and hit that subscribe button. Be sure to sign up for our morning newsletter, Hey Philly, to learn more about what else Philly's talking about. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Bye.